All right, our next speaker is Dirac Twidwell. Dirac is an associate professor at the University of Nebraska based in Lincoln, where he focuses on large-scale resilience planning and how simple changes in nature lead to surprising and unexpected consequences to human well-being. Help me welcome Dirac. All right, great. Uh, always awesome to be here. Thank you, Jeremy and Brady, for putting this together. And I've just really appreciated the opportunity to uh, really try and work with these major advancements in technology and what new questions could empower scientists, managers, educators going forward. Uh, we're entering an entire new era for the rangeland profession. Um, I happen to work in a, a agronomy department um, and work across units with the Law and Policy Center at Nebraska, computer scientists and engineers, uh, the School of Natural Resources, Agricultural Economics. And what you see is all of those groups tend to be focused so much on innovation. And when I look at a lot of how we manage natural resources, you can actually date current practices we do back to like the late 1800s, early 1900s. We, we don't have the rate of innovation of some of our fellow production sectors that span uh, food production, uh, water quality management, um, and we're poised to jump forward. So what I want to hit on here that's been really nice and that really takes a, a team to think about what would be next for our profession. I want to show you a glimpse of what's going to be possible. And then I'm going to you know, pretty much dump on Dan Uden, uh, uh, really, uh, awesome uh, postdoc, poised for big things in our profession, to, to describe more of the details. So I get to be up here in arm wave. Um, because you even saw, Jeremy had to put this mic on me uh, for this to work, right? Like, uh, I'm not, I don't even know how to do that, let alone do some of the things we're talking about in this session. So, so think about this, large scale resilience planning. What we're really talking about is harnessing technology. Management without theory is often idiosyncratic. Uh, theory that doesn't uh, build on management or it's not useful to management isn't as successful as it could be. Technology is the same way. Most of our technology tied to remote sensing work is not informed by ecological theory. We need to co-produce these across all those sectors. That includes education. So as we go forward, keep that in mind. And, and I just uh, noted some other people, and I'm, I'm missing a bunch. We've shown this work with landowners, with NRCS, with BLM. We're producing this together, uh, thinking through how can we best inform the complexity of data and information we have today. So a grand challenge for the 21st century, uh, and it's going to become more, more important with future generations, is to avoid the types of undesirable transitions that are so severe, their consequences go beyond the traditions of any single discipline. We can no longer solve these by isolating the rangeland profession by itself, or agriculture by itself. We have to be able to span these groups. So some of the classic examples of regime shifts is when you go from, say, a very healthy coral reef system to an algal dominated and largely unproductive one. Another globally and international example, one of the best examples of regime shifts is grassland conversion to brush or woody plant dominance. And of course, one of the ones that's most well known, but we haven't seen for a long time and was before I was here on the planet, is grassland to uh, a, uh, eroded uh, state, so the Dust Bowl, right? One of the biggest tragedies that hit a simple transition in vegetation that affected so much of our well-being. Uh, we think of these, and a way to think about it is this nice line of resilience is when, uh, when you have these rapid and sudden transitions, it informs you of when resilience is being overcome. And we often think about this over time. So when you have these types of transitions, it's a flip from one ecological state to another over time. Partially, that view is a result of data limitations that we have that I'll show. The larger scale that we have, or some of these transitions, affect so many ecosystem services that we know they underpin things like food, energy, water, biodiversity. Uh, we've even connected this kind of stuff to school funding. So understanding that these are major transitions and have major impacts is key. <clears throat> One of the things that this model doesn't do is it doesn't explicitly incorporate scale. So there's a lot of debate of how to operationalize resilience because it doesn't include the context of scale. Panarchy was developed to consider scale. 
So Brady showed all these pictures of how we monitor vegetation, right? Field sampling measurements uh, tied to the field with tape measures and, and working in those areas. It tends, to, we tend to describe the system at a scale, a, a narrow range of scales that makes sense to our perception of how the world works. And of course, I'm killing cells right now, right? Our cells are dying and they're renewing and we don't interpret that motion that's occurring around us. It's beyond our perception. We're all moving at about, what, 60,000 uh, miles per hour? The Earth is moving. We can't detect it. Rangelands are no different. We view them as static. The world is moving around us. How can we describe this kind of variability and change that's broader than just what is happening here with traditional range monitoring? Uh, Panarchy emphasizes that you can't just think of resilience at a single scale. Large-scale resilience planning means these systems are also important to management. All of this leads to earlier detection of undesirable regime shifts is where the field's at. How do we prevent transitions, not just locally, but that are starting to manifest at subcontinental scales, at biome scales? What I want to go over and introduce today and talk about is a new philosophical approach for ecology that actually borrows from what has been so useful in medicine, where advances in technology allowed for the prevention and early detection of potential health problems. That's screening. You can screen for the possible presence of a disease before you even have any symptoms. And we can image that because I don't have any symptoms. I don't believe you, doctor. Right? It sounds so familiar. We don't act until we have to respond to uh, some symptom occurring on our own properties or in our own lands. So when we're talking about diagnostic testing, that's field monitoring. Right? We're diagnosing a problem that exists. We're going out there and detecting and looking for symptoms. And then we're trying to work with landowners to, <clears throat> to actually diagnose and, and then implement treatments that can solve a problem that already exists. Ecology does not yet have screening. Traditional early warning metrics are diagnostic testing. We're diagnosing a known type of transition, known type of driver. So keep this in mind. Can, how do we detect the things before we are experiencing them? Uh, it would lead to much more rapid and advanced warning. This is something Dan Newton uh, that, uh, that is coming out and, and that's being sent out for review uh, that, that talks about this, uh, this approach. In medicine, screening became possible with technological advances and computation power. It couldn't have happened without it. So we're now at this point where it's like, finally, continuous data coverage at a resolution of 30 meters by 30 meters every year, updatable into the future, at a spatial extent of the entire Western USA, right? A fine enough resolution, updatable for the entire Western US. That scope is what's needed for us to be able to do this. Otherwise, we're not gonna give very good indicators of screening for these types of changes and transition. At the same time, there are recent advances tied to spatial resilience theory and cross-scale resilience that have not been incorporated into rangelands. So I just show this here, like a lot of this stuff is tied to this, trying to detect spatial order of systems that are undergoing change. Just fundamental to resilience. The cross-scale resilience model is over uh, two decades old. It's one of the most well-cited papers in resilience and very little use so far in rangelands. Quantifying spatial resilience, multivariate metrics for change in rangelands and what those opportunities could be. This context of spatial regimes at very large scales. All of this is a pursuit of theory to quantify resilience at large scales and the spatial order of it. So there's this whole other branch of resilience going on. These are aligning technology and theory at a point where we can converge them and align to do new things. So what, what Brady and I, we've talked about a while, while he was developing some of this technology, we knew there was a point where we could bring some of these discussions together. So this next generation vegetation monitoring that came out with the rangeland analysis platform, this idea that resilience can be quantified, especially with the spatial context, so bringing spatial informatics to resilience theory. What would that look like? With this approach, we can finally start to look at a central tenet of resilience theory that we haven't been able to look at much yet. A fundamental reality is that two alternative states cannot coexist in the, in the same unit of space over time. 
Brady and I, and it's going to make him uncomfortable here, right? We can't coexist in the same space, right? We have to be separated. So the more I do it, he's actually going to show like warnings of uncomfortableness, right? You'll actually see variance indicators start to pop the more I try and share that space with him. We don't really care at this scale of the room because I can be, right, we can have some space between us. But you care if I start swelling up and displacing everybody in the room, right? We have, our bodies have hard known boundaries. Nature does not. So we're worried if a blowout becomes a desert, right? We're worried if a sacred cedar grove starts displacing rangeland across multiple states. That's this fundamental aspect. They cannot coexist in the same space. As a result, coexistence theory says they should negatively co-vary in space. So that becomes the foundation. I want to walk you through some examples. Dan Uden uh, will go in much more detail. But let's just think through all this complexity. Realize that what I'm going to show you took thousands of hours of processing time. Thousands of images are created with this to look at the temporal sequencing across scales of space and time of how vegetation is moving in rangelands. So let's just start with reducing this complexity a bit. What regime shift is expected or of greatest concern in a particular area? Right? So the Sandhills of Nebraska, it would be the potential for them to become an eroded unvegetated dune state again. That's where they'd start. Choose the functional group combination then, right? Those, those alternative states, are, when you're talking about perennial grass going to an eroded, uh, unvegetated state, that's perennial bare ground functional groups. That's why the functional group combination of the wrap was so useful for us. We can look at how those alternative states, through these proxies of functional groups, are unable to coexist in space and if they're moving. So we'd look at perennial bare ground. Do we detect a signal? This is what no signal looks like. This is what a signal looks like. So the more you go from uh, yellow to red, that's that negative covariance. It's an indicator of the inability for these functional groups to coexist in space. All right, much better than just raw data. Raw data of cover doesn't tell you that. It doesn't tell you whether they're coexisting or not. And I'll show, an, I'll show an example of that, right? We, coexistence of grasses and trees is a savanna. They're not alternative states. If they don't coexist, you get forest or woodland, or you get prairie. So the same thing here. That's what this signal looks like. So keep that in mind. The more it goes from, to, from this yellow to red, the more that that's indicative of negative covariance. Then we start looking at signal behavior. Is it transient over time? Meaning, does it pop in one year and go away? That's not a regime shift. That's just transient dynamics tied to uh, perturbation and change. What we're looking for is more persistent behavior over time. But we don't care if they're stationary. We care if it's moving. So only here are we really concerned about these big major changes tied to ecological regime shifts and systems. So, and then we can do it for any combination of functional groups. Because who knows what's really going on out there, right? We might see something new. So I'll just go through a bunch of examples. Are wildfires causing large-scale erosion in the Nebraska Sandhills? So we can just look at large-scale screening. We're looking for the Sandhills at tens of thousands of acres starting to blow because in 2012 is the worst drought they'd had on record. And then we have these wildfires. Well, Dan Uden can do this through Google Earth Engine and some of these computing processing. And you can actually see the boundary of the wildfire without any information on the wildfire. Because this is the inability for perennial and bare ground to coexist in that year. Well, of course, it consumed all the perennials, right? It's just a bare area. So let's look. Is that a problem? Here's what it looked like for five years before the wildfire, right? No signal at large scales. After the wildfire, no signal. It recovered so quickly that there's no signal even a year later because we got rain and it recovered really fast. So we don't need to reseed and spend a bunch of taxpayers' money for transient responses. Well, maybe it's not the scale of the wildfire then. Maybe it's an individual blowout expanding. So we looked at a blowout, and you can actually see that right here, uh, it actually shifted for whatever reason in this presentation. But you then get this masking by the wildfire, and just so you know, right there, they end up being the same place. We don't even see blowouts expanding, but we can track them. We can track all blowouts, not just a blowout. So you can start looking at scales of change. Well, maybe it's something else then. Maybe it's a different functional group combination. So we looked at perennial trees. Look at this signal that we see 
And see how it's so static and stationary over time? The 2012 wildfire hit, and it completely reorganized in complex ways and created a non-stationary regime signal. Well, what this was on the north side of a river was ponderosa pine. On the south side, deciduous juniper. Uh, so, pff, well, of course, of course it's going to reorganize that area. It didn't in the sand hills, but it caused this type of reorganization transition. So that's a signal for managers of where are we going to look? What do we need to do and intervene? So again, we can just hit this level of complexity. Well, let's jump to the Mojave. It's like, what else can we do, Dan? So we go to the Mojave, and let's look at uh, an irrigated network of crop fields. And so here you have this network. Look at this nice, tight, static uh, regime boundary between, uh, in this case, perennial bare ground. We looked at another one, and notice how this one's bleeding, excuse me, bleeding out in space. See how it's actually bleeding and it disappears? That to us is a signal of, whoa, we should go check out what's happening here. This is a signal potentially of uh, desertification being contributed from crop fields to this surrounding network of rangeland area. So just a signal of that contrast of difference um, that, that allows us to be able to target where to go and where to look. Amazing, right? Like, Think of how long it would take you to do that in the field, just to find that spot. Let's go to another example, Mesquite in the uh, panhandle of Texas. Here you have a property boundary. So this is actually a mesquite uh, shrubland. This is perennial grassland. And I just want you to focus on this area over time. See how this regime boundary moved? So for whatever reason, brush management was no longer preventing that flip and transition in space where it was more perennial dominated to uh, mesquite dominance. Well, let's go target that area. We're no longer going to do random brush management. Let's figure out how to prevent that from further spreading into perennial range resources. Uh, again, just unbelievable power at the scale of an individual property. We then looked at other signals, and it's like, what in the world is going on here? There's all of this, uh, this yellow, this negative covariance starting to manifest in space. What is happening? Well, we looked, and what you could track is, you, it, is it erosion? What is it? It's bare ground popping. What you see is actually this uh, area that had oil and gas infrastructure, so it was road development. Uh, it was purposeful, right? Okay, good to know, but it's not erosion. This is purposeful, but you can see energy infrastructure. The power of what we can see is enormous. Uh, we didn't know what was there. The signal told us to look. So again, this idea of screening for ecological change. We can do it at any range of scales. We can do it for uh, ecoregions, individual properties. We can track this non-stationary change from perennial to juniper woodland across 500,000 acres, where you actually see this pop over time, where in 2011 you're going, wow, this is a regional scale regime shift playing out. In 2012, you get this masking signal of the drought, because drought affects functional groups differently. And in 2015 through 2017, notice how we have a stabilization of the region. There were changes in management that actually started to correspond with the boundary of this regional scale regime shift. No different than trying to manage a property. These landowners were banding together across 200,000 acres uh, to spatially target how to manage. Without this information, it just happened to correspond with the boundary. So imagine with this, and we work with them with this, what we could do now to try and prevent further movement to that boundary. Again, like the massive potential of where we can go. We got national level, right? So any scale of change from an individual property to a national scale. And look at Montana, where uh, Brady and their group's at, the Sand Hills of Nebraska. We have national level uh, detection at biome scale level of detection of these major regime shifts. And when you see this, we get surprising ecosystem service consequences that no one could predict from field monitoring alone. And that's what this grand challenge is. These are so severe that generally, your doctor would tell you to avoid this at all costs, right? Exercise, don't smoke. We have addictions of certain management practices that make this worse. How can we actually prevent these types of transitions or detect them as early as possible to start implementing management here? That's this broad question. Dan will walk you through some more of this. 
So it's just now possible to detect this from individual properties to a national scale. So yeah, so I just want you all to think about what are the implications when we could start looking for screening, which is a class of methods that allow us to detect change without having to know all the mechanisms responsible for change, and that we can image it and track it from individual properties to a national level. The potential for a workforce within the NRCS, the BLM for landowners, we could start really putting to work some of our local knowledge in these areas much more than before. So with that, thanks a lot. Uh, and I'm excited to uh, just explore your all's thoughts on this as we go forward. Appreciate it.